On May 8, 2021, the Coca-Cola Company celebrated its 135th anniversary. With a history that spans more than a century, it's only logical that the brand has seen many changes since it first was founded. From selling nine drinks a day to selling nearly two billion beverages in more than 200 countries around the world daily, a Coca-Cola bottle has become the most recognized object in the world. But while Coca-Cola might be one of the best-known brands in the world today, that wasn't always the case. Curious to find out how the brand managed to raise enough interest in its product to become the billion-dollar industry it is today? Then keep watching! The product that has given the world its best-known taste was born in Atlanta, Georgia on May 8, 1886. Dr. John Stith Pemberton was its inventor. That a doctor created the beverage is already rather unusual, but you might be even more surprised to hear that it was originally created to combat Pemberton's morphine addiction. Let's travel back in time to the year 1850. That's the year when Pemberton became a doctor at the ripe old age of 19. However, when the Civil War broke out, he signed up for frontline service. Although he was a successful surgeon and chemist, he didn't serve as a doctor, though. Instead, he started as a first lieutenant in a cavalry unit and climbed the ranks to lieutenant colonel. But during the Battle of Columbus in 1865, he sustained multiple gunshot wounds and even a saber strike to his chest. His military career had to be put on hold, and to ease the pain, he was prescribed morphine, but he soon became addicted. Seeking a cure for his addiction, Pemberton began searching for other painkillers and toxins that could serve as morphine-free alternatives. In the end, this experimentation is what led to the recipe that later was adapted to make Coca-Cola. After trying numerous combinations, Pemberton began experimenting with coca and coca wines, and eventually he managed to create a recipe that contained extracts of cola nut and damiana. He called it Pemberton's French wine cocoa. The recipe also contained cocaine in the form of an extract of the coca leaf, which inspired the coca part of the beverage's name. While this may seem surprising now, at the time, cocaine was legal and a common ingredient in medicines. But just as Pemberton's business was taking off, a prohibition law was passed in his country and soon French wine cocoa was illegal. Interestingly, the drink's illegality was due to the alcohol, not the cocaine. Pemberton remained a step ahead, though. He replaced the sweetness from the wine with sweetness from sugar syrup, and he formulated the recipe by trial and error. One day, he accidentally blended the base syrup with carbonated water and a few more changes to refine the taste. His new non-alcoholic alternative debuted in 1886, Coca-Cola, the temperance drink. Instead of promoting it as a medicine, Pemberton decided to sell this recipe as a fountain drink. He carried a jug down the street to Jacob's Pharmacy, where it was sampled, deemed excellent, and placed on sale as a soda fountain drink. The price for a glass was a mere five cents. So, what's in a name? The name Coca-Cola was a suggestion given by Pemberton's bookkeeper, Frank Mason Robinson. As the recipe contained coca leaf extract and caffeine from the cola nut, the name Coca-Cola was easy to come up with. But Robinson was known for having excellent penmanship, and he thought that the two C's would look striking in advertising. So, cola became cola, and the brand name was born. Soon, the first newspaper ad for Coca-Cola appeared in the Atlanta Journal, inviting thirsty citizens to try the new and popular soda fountain drink. About nine servings of the soft drink were sold each day, and sales for that first year added up to the total of about $50. As it cost Pemberton over $70 in expenses to create the drink, the first year of business wasn't much of a success. Soon after his drink hit the market, Pemberton also fell ill and nearly bankrupt. Sick and battling with a morphine addiction once again, he gradually sold rights to his formula to his business partner. Pemberton had always had a hunch that his formula would someday be a national drink, so he attempted to retain a share of the ownership to leave to his son. 
However, Pemberton's son wanted the money, so in 1888, they sold the remaining portion of the patent to Asa Griggs Candler, a fellow pharmacist with great business acumen. The price tag, $1,750, which in current purchasing power is equal to $47,000. By 1895, Coca-Cola was sold and drunk in every U.S. state and territory. And by the turn of the century, it was one of America's most popular fountain drinks. Not bad for a product whose existence had remained largely unknown to consumers outside the Southeast. How did they make it happen? Well, it was in large part thanks to Candler's aggressive marketing. To address the lack of brand awareness, Candler came up with an unusual idea, a mass coupon initiative. He started giving away free sample coupons to anyone who would try a sip. And from 1894 through 1913, more than 8.5 million sample coupons were redeemed. This meant that 10% of all products were given away for free. While this was a big investment, it seemed to work. And by that time, one out of every nine Americans had tried the sweet beverage. Candler also provided retailers with Coca-Cola swag like posters and soda fountain urns for decorations and calendars, pencils, and clocks for customers. Coke was truly a pioneer in linking a brand to items unrelated to the product. And it was clear to Candler that Coca-Cola was as much a drink as it was a consumable brand, an idea consumers could feel good about identifying with. While advertising was an important factor in the successful sales of Coca-Cola, so was expanding distribution. By adopting a franchise model and selling the rights to bottle Coca-Cola more broadly, Candler aimed to create nationwide demand for his product. And once again, it seemed like his idea worked. At the time, Coca-Cola was sold as a syrup that retailers would mix with soda water. But it wasn't typical to drink it on the go or bring it home. Now that Coca-Cola began selling syrup to independent bottling companies, however, it became more than a mere drink that you could order at a soda fountain. This marked the beginning of what the company internally calls the Coca-Cola system. Instead of being one giant company, Coca-Cola became a system of small companies. And it is this franchise partnership with bottlers that allowed the brand to truly take off. Candler's original advertising budget was $11,000. In current purchasing power, that's nearly $282,000. While that was already not too shabby, it didn't take too long before that number started going up and up and up. By the beginning of the 1900s, the marketing budget had already multiplied tenfold. And by 1911, it had skyrocketed to more than $1 million. Celebrities were endorsing the brand, outdoor billboards and radio program sponsorships were added to the advertising mix, and in 1931, the famous Coca-Cola Christmas advertising campaigns began as well. Big changes to say the least. But besides its advertising and expansion, Coca-Cola's packaging also knew a very important evolution. Until the 1960s, both small town and big city dwellers enjoyed carbonated beverages at the local soda fountain or ice cream saloon. For many years, they served as a meeting place for people of all ages. But as commercial ice cream, bottled soft drinks, and fast food restaurants became popular, they drastically declined in popularity. To make matters worse, Coca-Cola was also losing market share to hundreds of copycat competitors who were all attempting to imitate its success. To confront this, Coca-Cola launched a national contest for a new bottle design. It would signal to customers that Coke was a premium product that shouldn't be confused with any other brown cola in a similar clear glass bottle. And they challenged glass companies to create a new design that was so distinct that it could even be recognized by touch in the dark or when broken on the ground. Seeing a great opportunity, the Root Glass Company decided to enter the contest. They based the design off the product's name, and while combing through the dictionary for the word coca, they came across an illustration for the cocoa plant that caught their attention. Coca-Cola had nothing to do with cocoa, but the cocoa pod had an unusual but appealing shape. The team got to work and was declared the contest winner. While Coca-Cola originally commissioned the bottle design as a piece of defensive marketing, they soon began promoting the shape as much as the logo and product. And even after plastic replaced glass, as the standard means of drinking Coke in many Western countries, the company continued to promote the image of the Coke bottle as an icon. 
Now more than 100 years old, the Contour bottle has become a celebrated and instantly recognizable icon around the world. This goes to show to run a successful business, setting yourself apart from your competition is so important. You must approach things a little differently and make yourself as memorable as possible. And as your personality and brand are unique, they should shine through in all your interactions. Besides aggressive marketing, expanding its distribution, and setting itself apart from the competition, there was another thing that led to Coca-Cola's massive success. They took risks. By the late 1970s, consumers were increasingly more interested in low-calorie drinks. So, to reignite sales and satisfy this increasing appetite, Coca-Cola began developing a new drink, Diet Coke. Although there were initial concerns that a new diet drink would diminish the trademark, Within a year of its launch, Diet Coke became the most popular sugar-free beverage. The introduction of Diet Coke was an important milestone for the company because it started a new period that prompted the company to take risks in introducing unique new drinks to meet customers' changing needs. However, not all of Coca-Cola's marketing ideas have been hits, and one such example was the launch of their new Coke formula. By 1985, Coca-Cola sales were once again declining rapidly due to an increasingly competitive cola market. Consumer preference and awareness were dipping, and things were looking bleak. To compete and revitalize the cola market, Coca-Cola decided something drastic had to be done. It removed its flagship product from the market, and for the first time in 99 years, it changed the fabled secret formula. New Coke was the new Coke bottle in town, and its launch date was April 23rd. In taste tests of nearly 200,000 consumers, the new formula had come out as the winner. So, to Coca-Cola, it only seemed logical to replace the old formula and offer customers what they truly wanted. But soon enough, Coca-Cola would discover that simply changing the flavor of the world's most popular soft drink wouldn't be so easy. You see, what these taste tests hadn't shown was the bond consumers felt with their beloved Coca-Cola, something they didn't want anyone, including the Coca-Cola company, tampering with. Fans had a very negative reaction to the new recipe, and some even became outright hostile. Pundits were talking about the marketing blunder of the century, and calls of protest began flooding in by the thousands. By June, Coca-Cola was getting 1,500 calls a day, compared with 400 a day before the taste change. People were upset, and they held any Coca-Cola employee personally responsible for the change. While this may have seemed like a bad thing, Coca-Cola quickly understood that this was actually a blessing in disguise. Amid negative media coverage and desperate consumers trying to fill their cabinets with as much original Coke as possible, an emotional connection was discovered between the Coca-Cola brand and its consumers. Suddenly, everyone was talking about Coca-Cola, realizing what an important role it played in their lives. How did this firestorm end? Well, within just three months, the original cola that captured the hearts and taste buds of the public returned. That July, the story that the old Coca-Cola was returning to store shelves as Coca-Cola Classic made the front page of virtually every major newspaper. Consumers applauded the decision, and it was clear to everyone that Coca-Cola was so much more than just a beverage. The company re-emerged as the leading soft drink in America. And instead of a business blunder, the formula swap became an accidental stroke of marketing genius. This story stands as testimony to the power of taking intelligent risks, even when they don't always work out as intended. At the 10-year anniversary of the so-called business blunder, then-chairman and chief executive officer Roberto Goisetta said the new Coke decision was a prime example of taking intelligent risks, and he deemed it critical to a company's success. We set out to change the dynamic of sugar colas in the United States, and we did exactly that albeit not in the way we had planned, Goisetta said. But the most significant result of New Coke by far was that it sent an incredibly powerful signal, a signal that we really were ready to do whatever was necessary to build value for the owners of our business. For more than a century, Coca-Cola has managed to retain its popularity and keep up with the times while remaining entrenched in nostalgia. 
Over the years, the brand has never stopped expanding and diversifying its portfolio, and it has grown to offer more than 3,800 drinks across a wide range of categories, sometimes launching more than 600 products in one year. Its many products are consumed at a rate of more than 1 billion drinks per day, and through its savvy marketing techniques, it has reached a level of brand recognition that most can only dream of. There's Apple with a bitten apple, McDonald's with its golden arches, and Coca-Cola with that bright red bottle. Pretty impressive. That said, the company has also faced its fair share of controversies. Since the early 2000s, the criticism of the use of Coca-Cola products, as well as the company itself, have escalated. And with complaints about health effects, environmental issues, animal testing, economic business practices, and employee issues, the brand has been faced with multiple lawsuits. Nevertheless, it seems that people all over the world still love their brown beverage just as much. This was the story of how a cocaine-infused elixir became the billion-dollar business that it is today. The story goes to show that setting yourself apart from your competition and taking intelligent risks can make or break a company. What did you learn from this video? And are there any details you think that we forgot to cover? Share in the comments. And don't forget to check our channel for more inspiring business videos.